Well, good morning, y'all. So I hear a lot of people say this, and I'm sure you do too, where people say, I am a spiritual person, I'm just not religious. And I think what they're really saying is that while I may believe in my, that I have a soul, while I may believe that there is a God out there somewhere of some sort, they really don't want to affiliate with any kind of organized religion. And it could be for a variety of reasons, but I would say that most of the time, it's because they want to be free to believe in what they want to believe in without having somebody else's beliefs forced upon them. And my guess would be that there would even be a significant number of people, even in this room, who may subscribe to that way of thinking. But here's the question, and here's the question that we're going to harp on for a while. And that is this. What are your beliefs based on? It's a little like voodoo. There's, uh, I've been told by many missionaries who are over in Haiti, where there is, when you have people in Haiti who have been practicing voodoo all their lives, it's a very cultural thing for them, and they uh, decide to become a Christian, practicing voodoo is such a part of who they are that they still tend to mix a little voodoo in with their Christian faith. And I'm guessing there's a whole lot of us who have a little voodoo going on in our theology. And I believe that we kind of create our own cocktail. We mix in our own Americanized beliefs in with what we've been taught in the church with just a little smidgen of stuff that we've just made up in our head which becomes this mix that is way more about me than it is about what the Christian faith is really all about. We dilute our faith to the point that we may not even be able to discern what's Christian and what's not anymore. It's just something we made up in our head. And we believe our own truth. It amazes me when you look, especially at the American culture, how much time we spend in school and we spend in time in training or studying to try to understand particular subjects or to prepare for our careers. And when you look at, at the time that we actually get to use, utilize that education, it is like a drop in a bucket compared to the amount of time that we will spend in eternity, and yet we do very little, if anything at all, to think about, prepare, study for, better understand what comes next. How will we spend the rest of eternity? What does that mean for me? And most of us, I fear, we just leave it all up to faith. It just is what it is. If you know me at all, you know that I think that it's absolutely critical and important that we not only think through our beliefs in a meaningful way, but that we build our own faith with our own two hands, so to speak. That is to say that we think through it, we study it, we question it, we struggle with it until it becomes something that I own to the point that it defines who I am. My faith drives who I am. And so this morning we are embarking on what is probably the longest message series, I think, in the history of the 20 years of Westridge. Um, and Greg and I are going to spend the next four months cuddled up with you to um, discuss and to walk through the Bible 
highlighting what we believe are some of the most important truths, and more importantly, to help us all to be able to connect the dots throughout the entire Bible so that we can fully understand the story of the Bible. And what our hope is that at the end of the series that we can put together what's called a systematic theology. In other words, it's a, a framework of the main tenets of the Christian faith as taught in the Bible that set it apart from other religions and worldviews. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to walk out of this room with all the answers that you're looking for, because honestly, there's a lot of unknowns. In fact, I would say there's more unknowns than there are knowns. That's why they call it faith. But the truth is that a lot of us, I'd even say most of us, have never taken the time to really think through our belief system and understand it, and to make a decision about what it is that we believe and what it is that our beliefs are based on so that we can fully understand the Christian faith as it is contained within the pages of the Bible. And if we're going to put our trust in something, we better dang know dang well know what it is that we are putting our trust in. And so the question that I would ask is, what do you really believe about this book we call the Bible? But what are your beliefs based on? It was Mike Lockefeller and the Hammered Dulcimer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? it? Covered all of our beliefs right there, in a nutshell. Um, this morning, I, I think what I want to do as a way to begin this extraordinarily long series uh, is to uh, give a quick introduction uh, to the series by talking a bit more about our, our quest for truth and what is the source of our truth. Because I think that if we, don't, if we don't have this starting point of, of our beliefs, if we can't kind of take everything that we believe and go back to the origin of what it is that we believe to have some type of proof source, then really our beliefs aren't based on anything. We have zero foundation. We have really zero faith other than what we have put our faith in uh, of ourselves. And so, as many of you know, I think, that I'm, I'm pretty much a skeptic by nature. And believing in Christianity is something that doesn't come naturally for me. It's been a whole lot of uh, work for me through the years to build my faith. I don't really connect into the normal mainstream uh, churches. I... I, I don't really connect to Christendom as a whole, and so uh, it's been a struggle. And so this morning what I want to do is just let you in my head a little bit, which is a very dark, scary place, and I, I want to talk a little bit about how I um, determined what my beliefs would be based on, and I think that it could give us some guidelines for all of us about a foundation of, of an origin of our faith. And so, and here's the other thing, like during this series, Greg and I, we're not going to sit up here and try to convince you to believe what we believe. That's, that's not going to happen. I, I, I don't feel responsible for your beliefs, and I don't feel responsible for converting you over to my way of thought. Uh, I, I don't see it as my job to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. It's not my job to prove the existence of God any more than it is to prove that the Bible is true. It is simply my job, I believe, to make sure that you have thought through your faith and your belief system in a very thorough way so that you can make a decision for yourself that is not just based on your gut and you're not just rolling the dice with your eternal destination. Right? And 
Whatever it is that at the end of this series you decide to believe, and if you reject the Christian faith and you reject the Bible at the end of the series, I totally respect that. We can still sit down with a glass of wine and be friends. I'm just glad that you have thought it through and you, you, you've made a decision and you know what that decision is based on. But our hope and our prayer is that we can create a, a, a theology and a truth that's based on something that's more than just uh, a frivolous truth that I've made up in my own head. And so let me just set it up for you a bit. You know, when we're making a decision about what to believe, and we're really talking about that which is beyond this world, right? We're talking about the spiritual realms. We're talking about what happens when we die, origins of life, all of that stuff that go beyond our normal day-to-day activity. What is beyond this world? And when you look at the whole universe of possibilities, it kind of gets broken down into the way that Americans actually believe. So there was a poll that was done in terms of what Americans believe. 40 to 50% of Americans call themselves Christians and they go to church. They're people like you, church-going people. They call themselves Christians. They follow the Bible and, and move on. 40 to 50%, however, call themselves Christian but have no religious affiliation. Now, to me, that means that they haven't subscribed to any denomination or any belief system, um, any church, and really don't necessarily hold to the Bible as being true. Four percent would say that they are identify themselves as being part of other religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and, obvi- and, and then three percent would consider themselves and identify themselves to be atheists. Now, obviously, if you go to Israel, the majority are going to identify themselves as Jewish. If you go to Baghdad, you're going to get, you know, Islam. So it, it, depending on which part of the world you're in, the majorities, the percentages all shift. But what's interesting about these statistics to me, and really even throughout the entire world, 97% of people believe in God. Okay, so there's something that is in us that more of us, as we're created, or however you want to call it, we are born with this idea that there is a God, that there is something more, which is really interesting to me. Because if you're not a Christian, and you reject the Christian faith, and you reject the Bible, it would, it would just seem to me that perhaps there would be a lot more atheists out there than people who believe that there is a God, but there's only 3% of atheists, so I would say that's the exception and not the rule. Now, there's a lot of people who say that they're Christian but, and they believe in God, but here's my question. If they don't accept the Bible, then what is their source of truth? On what information are they relying on that they believe in God? On what source of truth are they saying that I'm a Christian? How do I, they identify or even know what a Christian is? Because by its very definition, a Christian is a follower of Jesus. And I'd be willing to bet that the majority of people who call themselves Christian do not believe that this Bible is the authoritative word of God. I'd even go as far as to say is there's probably a good percentage of people in this church and other churches that don't believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. So here's the issue. The issue is this is the only source of information that we have about Jesus, pretty much. Other than a couple historical references in uh, books from Josephus or Tacitus where Jesus is just absolutely referenced just very quickly, this is the only place where you can determine that Jesus lived, who he was, and is he worthy of me following him and calling myself a Christian. It's a conundrum, right? So now you're on a road to accepting this as being true. Be careful. And so when I built my belief system, personally, I really took the time to spend and really look at what was out there. And so I I looked at all the major religions. And the problem was the deeper that I got into them, the, the more I realized that I couldn't stake my beliefs on them. And so, for instance, I discovered that Buddhism, which has some really cool stuff to it, was never intended to be a religion. It's really more of a spiritual practice. I found out that Muhammad actually studied Christianity 
believed in the Bible at one point before declaring himself a prophet of Islam. When you look at Hinduism, you realize that they accept any truth that you accept as truth. Judaism and Christianity were the same for a very long time, right up into the point of Jesus, and that was the departure point. And so then you have to ask yourself, what do I believe about Jesus? What's my source of truth about Jesus? Because if I don't believe about Jesus, then am I accepting Judaism? And then, of course, I looked at atheism. And when you finally get past the sheer depression of it, I also realized that it takes as much faith to not believe in God with everything that you study and understand about the world, and that life is not just a big accident as it does to believe in the God who created the world and wrote this book. So the issue is, no matter what you choose to believe in, I don't care who you are, and I don't care how much you argue it, it takes faith. There is a leap of faith. We're going to talk about this in the whole creation and evolution thing in a couple weeks. It takes a leap of faith to believe in whatever it is that you're going to believe in. And you can't say that you're all scientific, that you're all non-faith or a-faith or however you say that. It takes faith to believe in whatever it is that we believe in. We're all going to put our faith in something. And the question is, have you, what have you put your faith in and what is your faith based on? That's really what I want us to drive home today and really think about. Because my guess is that there are a whole lot of us who are basing our faith on something that we've just made up in our head, that little faith cocktail of different stuff that we've just learned through the years and kind of have decided this is what I believe. But again, what is it based on? Seriously ask yourself, am I willing to stake my eternity on what it is that I believe? Am I willing to walk out of this world and into the next based on my belief system, based on whatever it is that I accept as my source of truth? And so after, for me, for, after a lot of soul searching, I realized that while you cannot prove a lot of stuff, you cannot prove the existence of God, you cannot prove creation, I suddenly realized there was only one thing that was reliable enough that I could base my beliefs on, and for me, it's the Bible. There really was overwhelming proof, and I really started peeling away the layers of the onion and really started delving in to try to understand this whole Bible and the history of it, and I really came to the end of my journey, and you have to do this for yourself, that I came away totally trusting the Bible, that that became my source of truth. And I also had to make a decision that no matter what I believe, no matter what I think, no matter the little voodoo stuff that I put in my head about what I believe and don't believe, it doesn't matter. It's what the Bible says that matters. And if you're going to accept the Bible, you accept the Bible. A lot of people think that the Bible somehow just kind of fell out of the sky and all of a sudden, boom, there it is. Hit somebody in the head and said, here's the Bible. But that's not the case. It was much more complicated, and I have to say even much more miraculous, of, of how the Bible came to be. So I'm just going to give you a quick little synopsis to help you understand where the Bible came from. So the word Bible comes from the Greek, and it is plural, and it means the scrolls or the books. And the reason why it, this is important is because of the fact that we tend to look at the Bible as a single book, right? We look at it like this, but it's not. This is actually 66 separate books that have been written over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, by more than 40 different authors that have all been brought together under one simple binding for our convenience. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now, the most important thing, there's a lot packed in there, but the most important thing that I want to emphasize today is that this, is, this passage is stating that the Bible really is the Word of God. We don't know exactly how, but we believe that God somehow inspired the authors of each book to make sure that whatever it is that he wanted to communicate was absolutely written down 
in this book, in the pages of this book. And so after the establishment of the Christian faith some 2,000 years ago, the early church created a criteria by which they would determine what scriptures would be accepted into the Bible and which wouldn't. And it's a set of criteria called the canon, which means rule or measure. And it is a standard by which the books of the Bible are measured to see if they are true and accepted as being the word of God. Now, compared to the New Testament, the Old Testament, believe it or not, which I would have thought would have been much more controversial, was pretty straightforward and pretty easily accepted into the canon because the Old Testament was always recognized by the people of God as being the word of God as the same scriptures were passed down from generation to generation before Jesus ever even hit the scene. So for generations, people had already accepted the Old Testament as being true. The Old Testament um, that, that we have in our Bible is the same Bible that Jesus, when it says that Jesus sat down and taught from the scriptures, it's the same Old Testament scriptures that we have. These are the scriptures that Jesus taught from. The same scriptures that I hold in my hand are the same scriptures that Jesus held in his hand. When we read stories about Moses or David are the same stories that Jesus read. Jesus himself recognized the Old Testament as being the word of God. So if you accept Jesus as being the son of God, then this is, this is kind of the whole domino effect, right? So if you accept Jesus as being the son of God, then Jesus has accepted the Old Testament as being the authoritative word of God. And so by definition of accepting the truth of Jesus, you've accepted the truth of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language and still to this day, the Old Testament is also accepted by Judaism. The Old Testament that we have is the same Bible of the Jewish people. And so there's very little controversy over accepting the Old Testament of the Bible. The New Testament, on the other hand, was a little controversial. It took a couple hundred years to be able to agree on which books of the New Testament would be accepted into the Bible. The New Testament is a collection of 27 books and letters collected by the early church and recognized by the early church as being the inspired word of God from the very first moments that they were written. Now, you would think that that's a slam dunk then, right? If, if they were accepted from the very beginning as being the word of God. The issue was not necessarily the 27 books. The issue was all the people that came out of the woodwork trying to get other books accepted into the canon. So people were trying to get these books accepted as being part of the Bible. And so the early church fathers created a set of standards by which they would have the New Testament canon and to make the decision whether these New Testament books would be authenticated and accepted into the Bible. In other words, they were making darn sure that when they said that they were putting forth the word of God, that it really is the word of God. And so there's four main criteria. There's a lot of little subpoints, but there are four main criteria of the canon to decide whether a book would be accepted into the Bible or not. The first one is that the question was, was the book written by an apostle of God? The author of the book or letter had to be recognized as an authorized person of God. In other words, some dude off of the street couldn't just come by and say, hey, I'm a person of God, and this is an inspired word of God, and so here, accept that into the Bible. That's not the way that it worked. For instance, the book of Revelation Mm, you know, that's a dicey book and probably wouldn't have been accepted into the canon had the Apostle John not had such incredible credibility. But John was one of the most reliable disciples of Jesus and so that's what gave that book acceptance into the canon. The second criteria is, is the message of the text of sound doctrine. Is it consistent with what the rest of the Bible teaches about God? So again, for instance, in the book of Revelation, while there's some crazy stuff going on, it is not inconsistent or does not contradict anything else in the Bible. The third one is, does it speak to the power of God and the Holy Spirit? Does it draw attention to the author and some part of history that the author wanted to highlight? Or does it really point to God, which is the point of the Bible? And then the last one was, was the book acknowledged by the early church as being the credible word of God? 
as the 27 uh, books of the New Testament, uh, they were uh, accepted as the word of God from the very beginning. So these were the rules of canonicity. And from these standards, the 27 books of the New Testament were all accepted as the authoritative word of God. I say all of that just so that everybody can help understand and go in eyes wide open about how this Bible has evolved and how it came into existence. So here's what I want you to know about us. Here at Westridge, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. We don't question it. We accept it in its entirety, and we will only teach what the Bible says. So, for instance, there are things in the Bible that I personally have a hard time with. I'm just being honest with you. And it doesn't matter whether I don't like it or I don't agree with it. My opinion does not matter and really should not matter to you. It's what the Bible says that matters, and so we have made a commitment here at Westridge that we will always teach, no matter what our personal feelings are, we will always teach what the Bible says. Always. Otherwise, you have no reason to trust anything that I'm saying. I'm just up here doing a TED Talk or something. Especially, you should really not believe what Greg says, (laughs) because that guy, (laughs) I don't know. But seriously, like, you know, we so blindly accept what, you know, pastors or teachers or authors say, and it's like, you know, Wikipedia or something. We just, like, accept it. There's a, there's a, a whole lot of people out there who put themselves up on a pedestal as being, like, experts in the Bible, and they really want you to believe that they're experts and scholars so that you can be in awe of them. But there are no experts, in my opinion, when it comes to the Bible. I mean, we're just all a bunch of messed up people looking for the truth and doing the best that we can in figuring it out. And the Bible was not written for academics or scholars or theologians. It was written for us. I mean, the New Testament was written in the Koine Greek, which was the Greek of like Chicago Heights, where I grew up, right? I mean, it's written for the common man so that we could all encounter God in the pages of this book, not to be used as a textbook. And so what we teach here does not come from some denominational board. We don't sit up in the church office and make up new rules to the Christian faith, although I think that would be fun, and I think I could have a lot to say. Um, But everything that we do is based on what the Bible teaches because we believe it is. We believe that this is the authoritative word of God. I hope you come away just understanding exactly what our stance is. This is the authoritative word of God, and we believe that this is our only source of truth because we believe that this book was inspired by God himself. Otherwise, what do you got? Seriously, what do you got? What are you basing your stuff on? So now, if you accept this thing, here's the rub, right? There are things in the, pro- in the Bible that probably don't fit with the religion that you've made up in your head, the little voodoo stuff you got up there, there's stuff in here that you probably don't buy into. What do you do with that? There are truths in the Bible that you probably don't agree with. What do you do with that? And the rub is, if we're going to accept the Bible as our source of truth, then we have to accept the entire Bible as being true or not at all. It's either all the Word of God or none of it is. We don't get a pick. I hate that, but we don't. That means that we not only accept the verses that say that we will end up in heaven by the grace of God through faith, which is great, but that we also have to accept the part of the Bible that says hell is a real place. And there will be moral people who do not accept Jesus who will end up there. And that's not something that we made up. That's not our decision. That's God's. It means that you not only accept the verses that say that God wants you to live a prosperous, fulfilling life, but that you also have to accept all the dang verses where it talks about giving your money away and loving your enemies and putting other people first and serving people as a commitment and taking care of the least of these. 
What do you believe about this book? I have to warn you, this is dangerous ground that we're on. This is thin ice. Because this now dictates that if we accept this book as truth, it means that you can no longer pick and choose what you want to believe and what you don't, because it's convenient for you. If you accept the fact that God created the world, then you have to accept those crazy miracles that Moses parted the Red Sea and some donkey talked to somebody and (laughs) Jesus turned water into really good wine. And if you believe that Jesus once lived as a man on this earth, because our only source of truth about that really is here, and that he was a good teacher, then you have to believe that he also died on a cross for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead as the Son of God. Crazy. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? This is one of those black and white, clear-cut issues of the Christian faith. And there is no room for gray here. It is either all the word of God or none of it is. We don't get to do a faith cocktail. We believe what the Bible says. So if you're heading down the path of believing that the Bible is true, You're heading down a path where you are now determining the course of your life. You're heading down a path where this Bible will define who you are, what you do, what you say, what your goals are in this life, what you dream about, and I'm guessing there are some changes that are required. It's important to know that all the evidence that we have about the Bible in every category where the Bible can be tested, it is always tested true. And next week, Greg is going to go deeper into this proof, but I fully believe that what we have in our hands today is the inspired word of God. And for me, This is the only thing I'm willing to stake my life on. Which brings me back to my original question. What about you? What do you believe? What is your belief based on? What do you really believe about this book?